I am Liz Schreyer. I am the executive director of the U.S. Global Leadership Coalition, and I am just delighted to welcome you to our annual conference, our symposium this afternoon, and we are in for an extraordinary treat of speakers to learn from, to talk with, to discuss some of the most difficult challenges that we face here in Washington and throughout the world. We are excited to kick off with a fabulous program this morning. Um, we are getting word that a lot of our folks from around the country got caught in the storms with airplanes last night, and some of the flights were canceled, but I know people are trickling in this morning, and we're delighted to see you. To begin our program, I am delighted to invite up our co-president of the U.S. Global Leadership Coalition, somebody who has been an enormous uh, voice and leader and guiding light for us, Bill Lane, who serves at Caterpillar for, I think, 37 years, to introduce and give an honor for our very first speaker. Bill, thank you for everything you do, and welcome. Uh, first of all, good morning. and. Uh, I, I have to tell you, I'm, re I'm really excited about this. Uh, I'm Bill Lane. I'm Caterpillar's Global Governmental Affairs Director. But the job I like best is uh, being uh, the co-president of the U.S. Global Leadership Coalition uh, for a couple of reasons. We, we all get to work together. It's just a terrific organization. And I've always found the, the key to success is to do whatever Liz says. And since I'm not supposed to be freelancing here, it's a great organization. And it's the best investment Caterpillar has ever made in Washington, D.C., and it really has made a difference. Now, I have the honor this morning to sort of kick things off by introducing someone who's really, really important. Um, he's a senator from Georgia, Johnny Isaacson, and, you know, I have to say that his commitment to this cause has just been overwhelming, and it, he got there in sort of a strange way. Like most people who are senators that come to Washington, his main goal was not to go on the Foreign Relations Committee. Even though when you think about the U.S. Senate, the Foreign Relations Committee is what the Senate is all about, advise and consent. But he became a member of the committee, after, and he's been in the Senate since 2004. Prior to that, he had uh, three terms in the House of Representatives. But on the committee, he became a real champion of our cause. He cared deeply about Africa. He chaired the subcommittee. And he truly came to the conclusion that the 21st century is going to be the century of Africa. And he backed up that commitment with action. Um, right now, he's the ranking member of the African Subcommittee. He also got onto another committee that's sort of important called Finance, which uh, has all sorts of uh, 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 long-term and short-term implications. And uh, I have to say, this is a true honor. As a Georgia company, uh, Caterpillar is proud to be in the state, but the thing we're most proud of is to have a close relationship with Johnny Isaacson, and I'd like to welcome him up here uh, to two things. Thank you, Senator, thank you very, thank you very much. Uh, before we get started, we do have an award for him. Uh, we were pushing for a... Uh, we were pushing for a, uh, a lamp or something like that from uh, a Christmas story, but instead we have this. And let me, uh, even though the, the writing is a little bit uh, small, it says an appreciation for your commitment to the international affairs budget, uh, Senator Isaacson. Thank you very much thank you and very welcome. Much. Thank you, Bill. Hold that. I'll take you out for a minute. Okay. I'm going to put it right here. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Bill, thank you very much for your commitment to America and to smart power and your commitment to the people of the world. I'm delighted to be here today. I appreciate the nice things that Bill said about me, but, you know, I'm really a piker compared to Connie Morella and Howard Berman and Dick Luger, who are going to be on the panel that will follow after me. I learned most everything I know from them, so don't pay a lot of attention to me, but listen closely to them when they come up here. But I did, you know, I did go on the Foreign Relations Committee eight years ago, and met a guy named Dick Luger, who was the ranking member at the time, and he asked me to take the Africa Subcommittee because nobody else would. And I took it mainly because Dick Luger asked me to take it. And once I did take it, I said, well, you know, you probably ought to go to Africa so you can at least figure out what you're talking about when you're talking about issues that affect Africa. And I began traveling to Africa eight years ago, and I have ever since. I just traveled in March to Tanzania, I mean to, I'm sorry, to um, South Africa. 
and to Morocco and to Senegal and to Mali, as a matter of fact, looking at some of the issues that affect the African people and the relationships of the United States of America and Africa. These travels have opened my eyes to realize that smart power and an investment by foreign assistance is good for the United States of America and it's good for the future of my children and my grandchildren. In the years that I've had the chance to travel, I've seen public-private partnerships with American companies and other countries work. I've seen us bring hope where there was no hope, education where there was no education, and opportunity where there was no opportunity. By way of example, I want to tell you a couple of brief little stories. I went to Ghazaria in Iraq, that's a suburb of Baghdad, shortly after a major battle, walking with a bulletproof vest on with a United States Army captain making microloans to Iraqis to reopen their businesses and start again anew. I traveled to Tanzania where Mark Green was the ambassador, met with the PATFAR leaders there and saw the miracle of Tanzania taking over more and more of the responsibility of delivering the retrovi antiretrovirals, of doing the testing, of making sure the PATFAR program worked, lessening the burden of cost to the United States but empowering the people of Tanzania. I traveled to Ghana with Coca-Cola and saw firsthand a packaged water plant where people who had had no clean water at all now had a sustainable way to have clean water for the rest of their lives with themselves and their children. I've traveled all over Africa and seen time and again the investment of American ingenuity, manpower, and intelligence in improving the lives of those people. And let me tell you why it's so important. Our enemy for the 21st century we all know is terrorism. And terrorism and the likes of Al-Qaeda and groups like that take advantage of two things hunger and ignorance and poverty. That's three things. I did go to Georgia, so I'm, you know, <laughs> I want to just add in that I recognize that. And what we're doing with soft power through our foreign assistance, through the NGOs in the United States of America, and through the investment that the American private industry is doing, is bringing about less poverty, better educational opportunity, so that we don't have those people that become vulnerable to be captured by those that would do ill to us and all the free people of the world. So smart power is the best power. It precedes the power that you have to use in military when all else fails. We should never let ourselves be an all else fails company, country. We ought to make sure we're making investment in the people of the world, making investment in peace and security and democracy, and seeing to it that there is no more hunger. That see to it there is more opportunity. And see to it there is more clean water and there is basic education for the people of the world. When we do that, people will trade with each other, work with each other, and not kill each other. And in the end, that's the most important goal you could ever have as a country, and that's one the United States of America should have. And I am honored that you took the time to recognize me today. I wish I could stay and listen to your distinguished panel. But work today, have a great time. And I know the theme of this conference is Washington from the inside. When you all figure that out, please let me know. Because <laughs> I've been here 15 years and I'm still working on it. God bless all of you and thank you. should never be an all else fails country. I wrote that down. I think that captures a lot of what we're here to talk about today. Good morning, everyone. My name is Mark Green. I'm president and CEO of the Initiative for Global Development and a proud member of the board of the US Global Leadership Coalition. This morning, I have the honor of introducing three former members of Congress, all of whom have played key leadership roles in advancing the cause of the international affairs budget and all of whom remain active on our great cause even today. First, a friend and former colleague, Howard Berman. Howard Berman represented California in the House of Representatives for 30 years. As chairman and then ranking member on the House Foreign Affairs Committee, Congressman Berman was one of the most influential members of the House and a true champion of foreign assistance. In his final term, he led an effort to draft a long overdue rewrite of a half century old Foreign Assistance Act. Since retiring, Congressman Berman has been advising a wide range of clients on matters of both foreign and domestic policy. And we are thrilled to have him as one of the newest members of USGLC's Advisory Council. Senator Richard Lugar. Senator Lugar represented Indiana in the US Senate for 36 years during which time he served as chairman and then ranking member of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Throughout his career, as we all know, Senator Luger had a role in nearly every foreign policy decision facing this country, 
from non-proliferation to food security to the role of the modern U.S. Embassy. He currently heads the Luger Center, a nonprofit organization devoted to finding solutions to global challenges. We're delighted that Senator Luger has also now joined USGLC's Advisory Council. Ambassador Connie Morella, another friend and former colleague. Ambassador Morella represented Maryland's 8th District in the House of Representatives from 1987 to 2003. Throughout her career, including her time as U.S. Ambassador to the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, she served as a leader in promoting economic growth through science, technology, and free trade. Currently, Ambassador Morella is president of the U.S. Association of Former Members of Congress and is the ambassador in residence at American University's School of Public Affairs. There, she teaches a course on women, politics, and public policy. And last, and certainly not least, is the moderator of this morning's discussion, Andrea Koppel. She serves as vice president of global engagement and policy at Mercy Corps where she engages the public on issues that most affect Mercy Corps' programs and beneficiaries. Andrea is a journalist by training, having worked for CNN for 21 years, including as the State Department correspondent from 1998 until 2006. And of course, she too is a proud member of the U.S. Global Leadership Council Board of Directors. Please joining me, join me in welcoming our esteemed group of speakers. Good morning, everyone. Uh, just so you know, Mercy Corps is, a, is an NGO, an international NGO that's, well, our panelists take their seat, that works in over 40 countries around the world. I'm guessing a few of you haven't heard of it before. Uh, just out of curiosity, by a show of hands, how many of you in the audience this today have done this before, maybe. have lobbied oh, on Capitol Hill? So, looks like about half of you. Um, and how many of you enjoyed the experience by a show of hands? <laughs> uh, well, hopefully tomorrow is going to be a wonderful experience for those of you who've done it before uh, and for those of you who've never done it before. And there are no better uh, teachers and advisors uh, than the three panelists seated next to me today. I was adding up collectively uh, the three, the three of these uh, distinguished panelists have over 80 years of legislative wisdom and experience. Uh, and we are so happy and so honored to have you today. Senator Luger, I wanted to start with you if I could. And you took office in 1977. Uh, Jimmy Carter was president. Uh, there were a few things going on in the world back then. Uh, we had some good news. We had the Camp David Peace Accords, which were signed between Israel and Egypt. Uh, we also had the biggest energy crisis that our uh, nation had faced. Um, and we also had the, a couple years later, the start of the Iranian hostage crisis. Back then, compared with today, international assistance as a percentage of, of federal spending was more than double, about double what it is today. Uh, help us to understand, because there are a few things happening in the world today, what it is that those conversations, when you were inside the Republican caucus uh, and you were talking to members of your party who didn't see the world the way you did, what were you hearing? What were people saying to you to explain why international assistance should not be as robust as it was uh, back when you first took office? I think very frankly, within the Republican caucus, there were those that were deeply involved in foreign affairs, and deeply interested. And uh, they were listened to and respected. Uh, they did not talk about foreign assistance, uh, a great deal. This occurred really within the, the committee confines, but nevertheless, uh, their leadership was respected. Uh, Jack Javits, friend Chuck Percy, 
come to mind, for example. Uh, and these were people who had, had sought to be on the Foreign Relations Committee, had sought leadership from the beginning. And so they had some latitude. Um, furthermore, there was less preoccupation, and this understates it, with uh, domestic economic affairs at the time. Uh, essentially, uh, the crisis now with regard to foreign assistance monies, and this has been true of State Department money for many, many years uh, as a larger category, is that uh, the money has gone primarily to the Defense Department to the point that former Secretary Bob Gates really wanted to give some of it back to the Secretary of State for things that could better be handled there. But uh, leaving aside that, uh, with our constituents, uh, very frequently uh, back home. Uh, the preoccupation, certainly since the Great Recession, has been with jobs, with the budget, with the deficit, with domestic affairs. You can go to sometimes open meetings and people will say, yeah, it's very nice that you're interested in foreign affairs. We respect that, but we don't want to hear about it. <laughs> we really want to yeah. talk about the budget. So what would you say in response? I would say that we still live in a very big world. It's a dangerous world, but one in which, uh, through the United States' ability to transport troops everywhere in the world, and we uniquely are able to do that. We're the only uh, country that has a fleet that is in all of the seas, that literally keeps the foreign trade system open for ourselves and for others, that this is our livelihood and our future. So we do spend money on the Defense Department to produce all of the above. But at the same time, uh, we are not going to be successful just with the ships and with the troops going to places if we have not been thoughtful about the rest of the people of the world. I, I'm impressed, for instance, with an article in The Economist uh, this week, in which they point out in the last 20 years, a billion people out of seven billion on this earth have been moved from the poverty or below poverty level. An extraordinary movement. And we have about a billion to go. And as was already recited by Johnny Isaacson so, so carefully and thoughtfully, uh, so long as there are that number of people out there susceptible to hunger and even starvation on a day-to-day -day basis, the possibilities uh, for terrorism, for all sorts of mal groups to take hold are always present. Uh, we really have to be facing constantly with others the, the idea of how do we feed the world, uh, how do we continue the great work with PEPFAR uh, and the anti-polio uh, campaign and so forth that have made such a difference in the quality of life and they give us some chance, really, of then expressing our thoughts to people who are not really at wit's end. Ambassador Marilla, we just heard uh, Senator Luger make an eloquent case for the, the mission-driven side of the international assistance budget. Um, as the former head of the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, I had to look that up because I can never remember OEC what mouthful. OECD stands for. Um, but as the former U.S. ambassador to the OECD, uh, looking at what's going to take place tomorrow, you've got President Obama who's about to head off on his second trip to the African continent. But what's different this time than the first time he went is that he's not just bringing his political advisors. He is bringing a delegation of hundreds mm. upon hundreds of American businessmen and women to go with him. Because it's not just about aid, mm -hmm. it's about mm. trade. But how is trade smart power for the United States? It really is. Thank you, Andrea. And first of all, I wanted to say, I'm Connie Morella, and I approve this message. <laughs> the, and the message also is that the U.S. Global Leadership Coalition does such a great job. And I want to commend all of you for being here and then going to Capitol Hill tomorrow. And I want you to know that one of the reasons I wanted to be here is because Senator Luca and former Congressman uh, Howard Berman are here. And although uh, Senator Luga has given 36 years, um, Congressman Berman has given 30 years, and I've given only 16 in Congress, <laughs> but then four at OECD. OECD came about, Andrea, through the Marshall Plan, 
It was George Marshall's words for a family of nations that brought together right now 34 nations that are the most developed. But they work on best practices to kind of uh, to level the playing field so that businesses in the United States and these other countries will have some of the same rules and regulations and look at the best practices. And so I think going to Africa is, is brilliant. Now, there's been a lot of controversy about taking an, a, you know, a, a large entourage in terms of the cost, but if you were to weigh the benefits, you would say that the benefits far outweigh whatever the cost may be for security, <laughs> et cetera. And I think being, bringing the business community says something about what the benefits can be when you can assist countries uh, in terms of education, in terms of the best business practices, in terms of health. You have stability, and when you have stability, then companies are willing to go there. Trade is a really key element, and I hope that when you go on Capitol Hill that you do talk about the benefits of trade as uh, foreign assistance is uh, the package that you are concerned about. So we can, we can come up with a scale and we can show all of the benefits of this particular trip in terms of, as you mentioned, smart power. But bringing, um, bringing the business people gives it a newer dimension, which is so critically important. And P.S., the Chinese have been doing it for years. Yes. Uh, Congressman Berman, uh, before you retired uh, from Congress, you worked tirelessly uh, to reform the Foreign Affairs Act of, wait for it, 1961. Mm -hmm. All right, just to put that in context, yeah. Breakfast at Tiffany's was the hot movie in the box <laughs> office back then. Uh, you also had the U.S. breaking relations with Cuba. You had the start of the civil rights movement. So that just gives you a sense of, of how long ago. And unfortunately, you weren't able to push it over the goal line. What do you think it's going to take to make that happen? And do you think it's even possible that it'll happen during the second Obama administration? Breakfast for Tiffany. That was the last, last good movie, right? No. <laughs> Uh, uh, the issue of the, the foreign assistance reform issue was born at the U.S. Global Leadership Coalition when Liz Schreyer and George Ingram grabbed me about a minute after I had become <laughs> chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee and said, what are we going to do about this law with its thousands of earmarks, its reference to institutions and entities that didn't exist anymore. Uh, 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 it's, it's lack of focus and direction for a foreign assistance program. Uh, uh, they made a case which I'm, I may have worked tirelessly at, but I certainly did not work successfully at, uh, which was to, to essentially try to rewrite our whole foreign assistance law. But but the key issue here is, is to make, this is such a different time. We, we just heard from the, your questions and, and what uh, Dick and Connie have said that foreign assistance isn't just about trying to do good or help people who need help. It is so integrated into a a globalized economy, or it needs to be so integrated into a globalized economy where it helps to create the institutions that allow for the trade and the investment. Uh, the story of Africa, for some people, it's a, it's a very de depressing story. It's about Sudan and what's going on in the Congo and the horrors. But if you look closer, you're starting to see leaders in Africa and the people of Africa deeply committed in improving their own lives, willing to take on responsibility for sensible policies, and we have to have a foreign assistance program that incentivizes that, that has country ownership, that separates the goal of foreign assistance from a particular bilateral U.S. Re uh, country relationship. Uh, for years, we gave billions of dollars to the government of Egypt, sort of as part of a, 
the bi close bilateral relationship and have no basis for thinking that that assistance made a substantial difference either for the Egyptian people or in the capacity of the Egyptian people in the future to get the benefits of better infrastructure. So the, the, the purpose here is essentially uh, to make it a program that lays the foundation for the trade and the investment and the growing prosperity, which is in every American's interest. So when we go to our constituents to talk about foreign aid, and first of all, they, as everybody here has heard from the US Global Leadership Coalition, they think it's 10 times larger than it really is, and secondly, think it's totally unrelated to their own lives when in fact uh, we can see the benefits uh, all over our country of trade and, and, and stability around the world uh, where we have it and, and how that helps make a more prosperous America. So it's a self-interest issue. Now your fundamental question is how do we turn it into reality? And you need so a few people deeply committed uh, in, a, in a Congress that's willing to sort of bring back the process of legislating uh, rather than sort of dealing with the crisis of the moment uh, in in an extraordinary and uh, a way. So when Senator Luger, uh, when we got into this, he was the greatest supporter of these efforts as the ranking member of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Um, my guess is People like Bob Corker and Johnny Isaacs and others are also people who will see the wisdom of trying to take on this program. And it involves constantly pushing. So part of what I hope when you guys go tomorrow is in addition to the very specific things you're gonna be lobbying on behalf of, which are very important, also some, uh, some attention to the larger question of, of, of creating country ownership of, of reorganizing our own agencies uh, to make uh, the aid more effective, uh, to restore the capacity of USAID to monitor and evaluate our foreign assistance programs. Not so much about how much dollars we spend, but how effectively we spend it. Speaking of, of, of spending uh, those dollars effectively, during your time in Congress, Senator Luger, uh, you were a leader on trying to end global hunger. The Obama administration just tried and failed to reform U.S. food aid, exactly. much as you had President Bush attempt the same a mm -hmm. few years back. Uh, what do you think it's going to take to reform food aid? And frankly, do you think that U.S. international food aid assistance needs reforming in the first place? I believe it needs reform. I strongly supported Rod Shaw and USAID's new idea that much more of the uh, food would be purchased on site where the famines were occurring, or at least close to that point. Could you explain it to the audience Essentially, the, way it works? the idea uh, now is that we, we have a, a food assistance program when a famine occurs. Uh, Farmers in America, food suppliers are summoned and, and food is bought from them. It's put on American ships and that's been a very important part of the thing legislatively and, and conveyed out uh, to the field uh, and distributed there. Now the, the thought was that uh, we in fact could buy the food in country, thus encouraging farmers at local levels. It would be present six or seven months before it would be present under the current system while people are starving in the meanwhile, and uh, we would not have the shipping costs. Now you run flat into, of course, groups that would say, well, we supported all this to begin with because you were buying from American farmers. Uh, secondly, you were paying uh, the freight for American shippers, and that's our interest in the thing. Incidentally, there's some food at the end of the trail for the people. Um, so I, I would just say simply, uh, it's a good idea. It will have to continue to be pressed, and I think Raj will do so. And while I'm speaking of him, I'm impressed with the fact, I think as you are, <clears throat> that over the course of just the last few years, about 700 people have been trained in USAID to be much more effective 
in the distribution of foreign aid or in foreign aid programs. And that's come despite budget cuts and all sorts of difficulties. In other words, the expertise involved has been improved very substantially. Uh, I think perhaps in this current atmosphere, uh, the, the program that's been mentioned was baited for difficulty. But even then, and I would advise each of you as you head to the Hill, there are still bills to come, places where amendments might be placed. Uh, this is not going to happen in the old-fashioned way by so-called regular order right now. <clears throat> but you take up a bill and everybody knows the whole process. It's much more likely to occur on s bills that are so-called essential, and uh, it's still a good idea. Um, while you all think of your questions, you may have questions right now. I'm just going to throw one more question to our panelists, and then there will be microphones um, that are here in the room, and if you just raise your hand, they will bring you microphones. We've got about 16 minutes left, time for a few questions uh, from the audience. Uh, I'd like to, like to start with you, Ambassador Morella. What advice do you have for these men and women in the audience today to be most effective in the way that they engage with either their member or a member of their senior staff? What worked with you? I mean, obviously, having somebody from your district makes a big difference. But is there anything in the way, do you need to get right to the point right off the top? Is an example helpful? What, what would help persuade you? What was mm -hmm. most effective? Well, I, I think uh, the people who are here are committed, so therefore they're pretty diplomatic, and we're talking about smart power. And so I would say to know what your agenda is. You can't focus on everything throughout the world, but decide what it is that you think is most important, to be pretty concise about it, uh, to listen, to let the staff listen to you too. I always would say, my rod and my staff, they comfort me and prepare the, paper, <laughs> <laughs> prepare the papers for me in the presence of my constituents. But don't <laughs> underestimate staff, please, because they will have the ear of the member. Um, and, uh, and, and so I think be respective of time too. But I, I think a point that you should keep in mind is that, you know, I represented a very highly educated district, Montgomery County, Maryland, and yet I can remember at town meetings talking about, even then, reducing the budget deficit, and somebody would say during the Q&A, well, let's reduce the foreign assistance budget. And I'd say, well, tell me, sir, what do you think we, we spend on the foreign assistance? 25%. And then someone else would say, oh, no, no, that's too high, it's more like 15%. But I say to you, it's more like 1%. And sometimes members don't even realize that when they're thinking about the various allocations of money. So I would say all of those things, priorities, conciseness, respect for uh, staff and members, and remember that you're talking about a very small part of the budget that gives a, a lot of benefits. Congressman Berman, what advice do you have? In addition to everything that Connie said, uh, with a focus on the conciseness and why it is in our country's interest and their constituents' interest to do this, leave some sense that people from their districts who care about this issue will be watching what they do. We want more accounting, accountability and monitoring in our foreign aid programs we also want it in our representatives. And um, <clears throat> the notion, this isn't a pro forma business. This is the start of a conversation which we'll see and we will be paying close attention, leaving <clears throat> that impression and, and uh, that you're there representing someone more than yourself, but uh, a significant voice in, the, in, in their districts, I think is, is, is a useful, part of the message done tactfully. Senator Luger, um, a number of those in the audience will be meeting with members of your party, um, some of whom are not in favor of international assistance. Mm -hmm. With that hat on, what advice do you have to offer them when they speak to people like Rand Paul, who absolutely, categorically think this is a terrible idea? 
Well, I would say you have to be very original. <laughs> uh, but I, I, I think the fact is that uh, Rand Paul is only one of several members of our party now who are really opposed to foreign assistance. And it comes down to the fact that they feel that talking about foreign assistance is a trivial pursuit as opposed to getting on to a discussion of the debt ceiling and very large changes in our whole bu budget structure. So uh, even though we're now in the Congress taking a look at uh, immigration and gun control and the farm bill and so forth, they would say, let's get on with the major show. What, what we came to talk about was the salvation of the country as we see it, and that cannot occur with trillions of dollars of debt, trillions uh, or hundreds of billions of dollars of continued deficit, in other words, it's a preoccupation with that particular situation. So uh, granted that uh, that's not what you may have come to talk about, the, the point I think is that uh, we're talking today about foreign assistance as something that does assist us in the war against terror and, and the dangerous world in which we live and, and building up of constituencies abroad that could be very, very helpful. Uh, it's smart power as opposed to sending troops in every direction very frequently and with the loss of life and so forth that's involved in all of this. Uh, Rand Paul and others will understand that. They're, I don't want to characterize all of them in one category, but they've read at least the polls that indicate that the American public does not want to be involved right now anymore in Afghanistan. A large majority do not want to be involved in any way in Syria. Uh, they do not really want to be involved in anything that may in, uh, have troops and may have loss of life. And so what we're suggesting is that um, in the absence of that, in addition to intelligence services and drone strikes and so forth, which are certainly more economical than sending troops, uh, the most humane and satisfying overall way would be to talk about food and to talk about opening up trade to, uh, for instance, uh, with the African Opportunity Act. The fact is, this was a great idea for textiles to come from Africa and the United States, often blocked by interests here, but that's the sort of thing that empowers people there to make money, to begin to build businesses. And, and so we wanna talk about trade and we wanna talk about how you get American business into countries. And we've got American students abroad and foreign students here. The telecommunications, uh, smart power that comes through media everywhere so people have some glimpse of our way of life. These are things that you might talk about. Wonderful. What would you like to ask uh, our panel? Gentlemen right there in the middle of the room. If you could tell us your name, where you're from, please. Thank you. Oh. Try turning on the switch. Is there a switch there on the side? There, I think it may be on now. No? Okay, why don't, why don't you just try speaking loudly? I can speak louder. Great. Screen. Uh, my name is David Litt. I'm with the Institute for Defense and Business in Chapel Hill, North Carolina professional education institute. But I'm also a retired Foreign Service officer, and that's where I would like to direct my question to our panelists. The programs on trade and aid are important, and also our ability to carry out, implement, and execute those through our institutions are similarly mm -hmm. important. So what would you mm -hmm. advise us as we go out and discuss on the Hill both the programs and the and support for the institution's human resources. In terms of blending our conversation, are we going to be more receptive on the programs than on uh, hiring more uh, experts in, in our foreign service and uh, in uh, USAID Department of Commerce? Uh, or can we go equally on both of those tracks? Thank you like to take a stab at that. Congressman Berman? Well, I'm... Sure. Yeah. 
I'm a big believer in maintaining and frankly strengthening the capacity of our folks in Washington and even more importantly in our missions in country <clears throat> to know what is happening with our aid to help shape what programs are given priority in a particular country in terms of the needs of the people of that country through the participation of the people in that country in helping to shape those programs. And to me, I think it's a big mistake to dump huge more money into a, a process without the capacity to help shape, monitor, and evaluate the effectiveness of those programs. Uh, Oversight, transparency are critically important to your constituencies and to the members of Congress. And this comes from the Foreign Service personnel. I have great regard for them because I represented a lot of them in Montgomery County, Maryland, and serving uh, at OECD, uh, those who were posted to that mission w were just some of the most committed, hardworking people that I have ever met. But, uh, but I think when you're talking to the members of Congress, do you want to talk about the benefits to their constituency in terms of, in terms of health, what we can do for stability, um, the benefits in terms of jobs, we talk about jobs and, and unemployment, what, what, what foreign aid does to create jobs through trade. So I'm thinking of also coming up with tangible benefits that the members can see to assist their country and their constituency. Senator Lugar? This is a more broad and comprehensive thought, but during my uh, travels in Asia in the last few months, I've been struck, first of all, by the impression, the so-called pivot strategy that is sending our fleet out around the South China Sea and elsewhere has made our participation in the ASEAN group and an APEC um, uh, specifically, uh, what I mean here is that the countries involved, Japan, the Philippines, South Korea, Thailand, Indonesia, all countries I visit, the leadership is impressed with the fact that we care, and therefore they're paying much more attention to our business needs, quite apart from our political needs. Uh, the, uh, the amount of American investment is increasing, the uh, prosperity in those countries has at least taken a turn for the better. Uh, granted that uh, Japan has its own problems with QE2 and th those difficulties, but uh, I would just say I was impressed, for instance, in the Philippines, where Clark Air Force Base, which was closed down a while back. Mm -hmm. Now there's quite a, a display of businesses outside there in the woods before you get to the cemetery. Possibility of opening this up again in some various ways. And that it was true in Indonesia, a whole discovery of what a great country this country is and how much we can mean to them, and their feeling of neglect before being rather profound. So to the extent that any of you have knowledge of business situations in these countries, quite apart from the history of these countries, I would express this to members of Congress. Uh, they will find this educational, because the fact is that the Indonesian ambassador uh, from our country told me only two members of the Senate had visited Indonesia in the last uh, year. Uh, now this despite the fact that uh, our diplomats through ASEAN and, and others are much more concentrated on this, and we really all need to be as a, as a whole government. Wonderful. In the back of the room. Yes, your Good name morning. is? Good morning. My name is Farman Kaleye. I'm a, a principal and founder of International Foundation for Justice. I'm an Iranian-American citizen. And the very uh, ex uh, purpose of me uh, physically here is uh, really a uh, colliding of two worlds. Uh, the American dream and oppressive measures of uh, Iranian regime. And uh, I wanted to bring your focus on uh, the question of Iran, I just got a tweet, a, a Twitter uh, statement from uh, Senator Kirk that uh, he would not allow Iran uh, to continue with this uh, rope-a-dope uh, strategy and wear uh, the world power, uh, the world community down. 
And uh, so uh, I have a lot of questions. Hopefully during the, this course of the next two days I will ask that, but that's, I want you to bring a little more focus on how we can uh, consolidate America's uh, founding vision of supporting democratic movements around the world and thus making the world safer. Mm -hmm. Well, there is a, a good portion of international assistance that goes towards governance and uh, democracy building and, and whether it's the International Republican Institute, the Democratic Institute. Senator Lugar, do you want to respond? Well, specifically uh, on Iran, this is a critical question <clears throat> in terms of, of American security, but likewise the future of Iran. Uh, let me just make a few points. Uh, first of all, in the previous election in Iran, the State Department did uh, begin to unleash the idea of smart power through iPhones and all sorts of communication devices. Young people in Iran caught a hold of that. We got pictures of what was going on in Iran, literally coming back from these phones and so forth. This was during the Green Revolution. Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, we began to find a constituency there of people who really would like to know more about the United States, and we'd like to know more about them. We would like to have more of a sharing. Ultimately, this is going to be very important, although maybe not in the next uh, two weeks or so. I, I would just say that this probably led to a different kind of election this time around, in which there was large participation. Now, great mm -hmm. skepticism as to whether uh, Khomeini pays any attention to the whoever was elected, but at the same time, some possibilities here that are, that are important. Uh, I think that we do need to take a look once again at the, the possibility for communication of our ideas uh, and that, that it makes a difference ultimately in all of this. Now, beyond that, in this country, we need to be having a proper debate, uh, regular order. Let's say all sorts of rumors about how far the uh, nuclear program can go, the enrichment, before it's intolerable and before somebody needs to strike and take it out and so forth. We're talking about war. We're talking about a very large war, not something that is ended in a few days and so forth. Uh, we better talk about this in the right way as a country, whether you want to declare war or not. If, if we do, we ought to have the proper hearings and debate and uh, authority in the Congress on this situation, as opposed to hints here or there that the leadership might do this or that. Uh, and, and because same time that we're all taking polls showing we want to be out of every place, uh, our, our leadership may be talking about how we are going into some place because it's intolerable to have nuclear weapons there, and it may very well be, but this debate hasn't occurred in this country, and it needs to, and, and the Iranian people need to know that we're having the debate. Um, and we need to be able to communicate, particularly with the young people there, who have a stake in the fact that their economy is declining, the sanctions are having an impact. If they are more comprehensive, they will have even more of an impact. Uh, and these are at least some random thoughts about the uranium picture. Wonderful. Either one of you? Yeah. We, have, we have different objectives with our Iran policy. The nuclear Iran, Iran's nuclear weapons program, I think, is justifiably a very high concern uh, for the American government and for, uh, uh, and for the international community because the implications of Iran having a nuclear weapon, there are many of them. By the way, and I don't think, well, I think them using it always has to be considered. That isn't the first reason of concern. It's, it's how it alters the, the balance of power in that part of the world, the death of the non-proliferation regime, the inevitability that a number of other countries in the region then will seek to get nuclear weapons. So it's a high priority. We also have other priorities with Iran. Uh, their support for international terrorism, uh, and what the, uh, the questioner raised, which is the, uh, the nature of authoritarian rule, the suppression of the, the people and their rights. And 
and uh, Senator Lurgu was right, we have started in some smart ways, even notwithstanding all the different sanctions and all of that, to get to try and help enable the Iranian people to be able to both get information and give reporting of what is happening inside Iran. It's very complicated. I think this administration is actually handling it sort of right. We are using different tools and our authority to build an international coalition, not an America go it alone program, but an international coalition to apply pressure on the regime with the hopes of reaching a diplomatic resolution which can give confidence that Iran's nuclear weapons program has ended. And th that's, that's the strategy. Part of that involves the implication that this is serious enough that uh, all options remain on the table, including a military option. And the question is whether the strategy can be successful. I don't think any of us know for sure. There were interesting signs in this last election that the, the candidate, the, the irony is in Iran, we are so estranged from the government of Iran and have been now since the, revol the, the revolution there. And what polling is available shows that in that part of the world, there are no people that are more pro-Western, pro and pro-American yes. than the Iranian people. Yeah it makes one think that there is an inverse relationship between how close we are to a government and how much the people of the country like us. Um, uh, but uh, so, I mean, this is a, you, you touch on a very important issue. How, in the end, one part of our foreign policy goals are to promote what we consider to be universal values regarding the right of people to choose their own form of governance uh, and some basic fundamental human rights that no government should be able to stifle. And we always have to remember that how you successfully pursue that uh, is very much a subject of debate now as we watch what's going on in the different spring times that are occurring around the world, so to speak. I know our conversation has been very, very heavy thus far, and in our remaining uh, couple of minutes here, mm -hmm. I've been asked to to have a little lighter end to our panel. And if you'll humor me, I've been asked to, to do a very, very short actor studio. And I'm going to ask you if you've ever seen this program on PBS, and I love it. Uh, at, the, at a certain point during the interview, um, they are asked just to give a one word answer. So I'm just gonna ask you a couple of questions just to show another side of, uh, of our distinguished panel. Um, and just beginning with you, Ambassador Morella, a uh, favorite movie, recent movie? Ah, okay. Uh, I think it was 42. <laughs> that was the, uh, the Robinson story, which is really great. Oh, okay, yeah, really Congressman great. Berman? Anything done by Quentin Tarantino, the vulgar Ooh. violence <laughs> really. <laughs> Senator Luger. There was a movie about uh, uh, Ran, and I can't remember the name of it now. <laughs> the Academy Award winner. Argo. 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 Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah that was yeah. a terrific yeah. movie. Uh, favorite book, Ambassador Morella? Well, you know, right now I'm finishing up uh, Olympia Snow's book on common ground because it's what we've lived through from her perspective. Congressman Berman, what are you reading now? Uh, I'm trying to choose between Ken Pollock's new book. It's my husband. Okay, it's coming out in September on and, Iran. And Texas Hold'em for Dummies. <laughs> Senator Luger. Well, I've been uh, reading David Hamburg's new book, that you each have a chance, and uh, a wonderful new biography of C.S. Lewis. And final question, favorite swear word? <laughs> Oh, I, I that would be under my breath, so I wouldn't <laughs> dare use it here. <laughs> what letter does it begin with? Oh. <laughs> what incrimination that is. <laughs> Do you think you have Rahm Emanuel on the exactly. panel? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> oh. All right. 
Any I, I, de I defer to the gentleman. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> Too heavy. No, no, no. Too heavy. <laughs> Congressman Berman. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, I want to thank all three of you for a fascinating discussion, for taking the time to come here today. And I, as a board member of USGLC, want to offer also my sincere thanks to each and every one of you for taking time out of your lives to come to D.C. Uh, and lobby on behalf of this incredibly important issue. Thank you so much. And good luck. Thank you. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you Senator. Thank you, dear. And thanks again to Andrea and our panelists for uh, uh, this morning's presentation. I hope you found it as interesting as I did. So there's an old adage that there's no such thing as a free lunch. Well, there's no free breakfast either. We are now beginning to uh, move forward and mobilize for the very important work that we have ahead of us. Uh, we're going to be breaking into smaller groups right now for a series of leadership development workshops. USGLC staff is positioned at the ballroom doors to direct participants to these sessions, which will begin promptly at 9.15, so just in a few minutes. I hope all of you will proceed directly to your next session so they can get started on time. Following these leadership sessions, everyone will be leaving for the U.S. Institute of Peace, so make sure you take all of your belongings with you as uh, you leave the ballroom. Thank you for being here this morning. Thank you for what you're doing for this great cause. We have a lot of work ahead of us, but as you can tell from the, the fine leaders we've heard from this morning, uh, certainly we're on the right side and there's a lot that's taking place. It's very, very positive. So thanks again, everyone, and have a great day.